and welcome. And, uh, of course, I'm asking. <coughs> Still breathing the air of the resurrected Lord. <laughs> it's a wonderful time of the year, right after the resurrection. And uh, every time through Holy Week, we follow along the Gospels Holy Thursday night, Holy Friday, and uh, the Gospels of the resurrection. Hopefully, every year we see new things. We see new things. And we'll answer a few of the questions that people have because there are some difficult verses, you know, in these Gospels. And one of the questions which has perplexed many interpreters is the statement of the Lord when he resurrected and Mary Magdalene saw him she ran to grasp his feet. And he told her, Mary, do not touch me. Mimuaptu, because I did not ascend to my father yet. Just go tell my brothers. He called the disciples his brothers. What an honor for Christ, the the resurrected Lord, to call us his brothers because we will also, as we'll see in this class, we will also follow in his footsteps, in his res- resurrection. We will, we will also enjoy his glorious resurrection, just like he resurrected. But he told Mary Magdalene, do not touch me. However, in Matthew, we see that the women that went to Uh, go to the tomb, Matthew says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who is the other Mary? The Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, the other Mary. The evangelists do not bring her out. They don't accentuate the role of his mother in the resurrection because he would not be a very good (coughs) witness. She would not be a very good witness to those outside. So her role, her role is silenced in the resurrection, even though in the hymn in the church, the angel was crying out, we know from the tradition of our church that the first person that saw the resurrected Lord was the Virgin Mary along with Mary Magdalene, possibly, where we see this in the Gospel of Matthew. The two women were going to towards the tomb, and the Lord appeared to them, and they clasped his feet. However, we see that in, in one of the Gospels, in uh, John, in John, when Mary went to clasp his feet, he says, do not touch me. So Theophilus of Bulgaria, some of our church fathers say that Mary, after she saw him, yes, she believed, but then she ran to the tomb to certify the resurrection. She ran to the tomb, and she sees that the tomb is empty. And then she runs back to tell the disciples, because the angels appeared. So what's happening here is Mary is going back and forth many times. She didn't just go one time. She is running back and forth. One time she, she goes and there's nothing there. And she runs back. She leaves. The Lord appears. They clasp his feet. And then she goes and tells the disciples. They don't believe them. They think that, oh, you're just dreaming. The disciples are saying, no, no, this can't be true. So now she goes back again. She wants to make sure. And it's possible that when she saw the Lord for the second time, she went to clasp his feet again. And he says, do not touch me. Mary, it's over now. Those three years that we were together, it's not like this anymore. 
It's not like this anymore. He's trying to raise her mind spiritually. He wants to elevate her. Those things that we did for three years, we ate and drank together, you know, and we, we were always together all over the countryside. This is over now. Now I'm going to the Father. So don't touch me because I don't have exactly the same form that I had before. My body is different now. So do not touch me. You touched me before. However, to Thomas, he says what? Touch me. Because Thomas was not believing. He just thought this is impossible. It's not that he was calling the other disciples liars. They told him, you know, he appeared Sunday to them. And eight days later, because Thomas was not believing, he appears to everyone again. And he says, Thomas, and a lot of them were in disbelief. It wasn't just Thomas. But Thomas was the one who said, unless I place my hand, I put my hand in, in the holes uh, where he was speared and touch him, I will not believe. And Christ allowed this to happen, even though his body was the resurrected, the glorified body, the same body, the same body, but the resurrected body, spiritualized body that was going through the tomb, through the strips of linen, as John beautifully ex explains. You know, the strips of linen are there, and the napkin of the face is neatly folded and put aside. The angels did this. And also to disprove you know, the theory of the Jews that someone went and stole the body. What thieves would sit there, okay, and take these strips of linen off the body? It was impossible because we had 75, 75 kilos or pounds of myrrh and spices wrapped along with the swaddling clothes, along with the strips of linen. This was all in the body, and Theophilicus says that this substance becomes like lead, like lead. It becomes like a cast. So it's a physical impossibility for somebody to go there and take the body out of this cocoon. So the resurrected body of the Lord beamed through the strips of linen, through the stone, just like he was able to go through through the rooms without opening the doors. So we have here the resurrected body of Christ. And out of economy, the Lord allows Thomas to touch flesh so he would believe. He allowed it to happen. Just like he ate with them. Remember a few months ago we mentioned that he ate milk and honey in one of the prophets of Isaiah uh, of Isaiah in the uh, around Christmas time we mentioned that this child this child of Bethlehem he shall eat uh, milk and honey milk and honey of course he ate he was breastfed by the Virgin Mary but also he ate honey after the resurrection even though he didn't need to eat, but he did this out of singatavasi, out of economy, to reinforce the belief of the disciples. He was appearing to the disciples not in different bodies, but in different forms. He appeared in different forms after the resurrection. In the lake of... Uh, Tiberius. Peter was out there, a little bit depressed. He was, again, fishing all night long, didn't catch anything. And when they were coming out, they saw the Lord. They saw someone out at the shore. And he had a little fire there. And he asked, children, do you have anything to eat? And they said, no, we didn't catch anything. And again, he told, he told them, go and 
throw your nets on that side of the boat. And they came out with something like 153 fish. And Peter, who was didn't have a shirt, he was fishing. He put on the shirt very quickly said, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. And he jumped in the ocean and went out. And no one dared to ask him, who are you? Because it wasn't, it, it, the form was different. It was different. We'll explain this in a minute. And also when he was walking with the two, with the two that were walking on the road to Emmaus, it was Luke and Cleopa. They were walking and someone is walking by them. And he's opening their eyes. He's uh, opening their eyes. And all of a sudden, their heart is beginning to burn inside. And they were saying that, you know, this great tragedy happened here in Jerusalem. And, you know, didn't you hear what happened? Where are you from? They were talking to him, but they couldn't recognize him. He's appearing in different forms. Why? Because no one can see the resurrected body of the Lord as he is, as he is. No one, no created being. No one can see the full glory of the Lord. No one can see the full glory. They saw the disciples, they saw his glory as much, as much, as much as they could. Just like during Transfiguration, if you remember the uh, Troparion, the hymn of the Feast of Tra Transfiguration, it says that the disciples, they saw his glory, kathos ivinando, as much, as, as much as they could. In the same way, after the resurrection, the disciples see him, but not exactly as he is. And this is scriptural. Because with these created eyes, they cannot behold the full glory of God, of the Son of God. However, we will see, hopefully, we will see the full glory when? After we share in the resurrection. And this is our hope, according to St. Paul in Ephesians and those who have the hope of the resurrection purify themselves. They purify themselves. And in John, in 1 John, John tells us in the first epistle, the first Catholic epistle of John, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, like the resurrected Lord. For we shall see him as he is. Then, after our resurrection, our glorious resurrection, then we will see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. He is pure. We'll see how much our Lord loves purity. That's why the Virgin Mary and monasticism are so dear to the Lord. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to the Lord. When we sacrifice our passions and we avoid impurity, this is a living sacrifice. When the monks, 18, 19, 20 years old, 19, 20 year girls, they offer their virginity to the Lord. They offer this as a living sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice. It's struggle. They offer this to God. It's the greatest sacrifice to sacrifice our passions. And when we do that, we will see him as he is, just as he is pure. Our Lord loves purity, and that's why He was born from an immaculate and pure virgin. And who was the disciple that he loved the most? John. Because 
he was a virgin in the mind as well in the mind in the true meaning of the word he never had an impure thought pass from his mind and that can only be from the grace of God as well and that's why he gave his mother his pure and holy mother to the pure disciple and this is why when he asked for a donkey there was a was a donkey that no one sat on before no one sat on before when joseph of arimathea brought the sheet or the white linen was never was brand new never used before new the bible says that and also he was laid in a brand new tomb it was hewn out of in the rock that no one else was laid in for many reasons because he's the new adam he's making everything new all these things we see in the gospels during the resurrection what proof do we have that we will resurrect as well of course we have the resurrection of lazarus and we have the resurrection of the daughter of the leader of the synagogue these people died they died and christ resurrected and also the young men of the widow of nain he resurrected <clears throat> but a prelude to his glorious resurrection right after right after he said it, it is finished and the earthquake and all the the nature the nature is now angry at mankind because they crucified the lord of glory all of a sudden tombs was my opened up tombs opened up in jerusalem and dead people jumped out and these are not people that died 50 100 200 years ago these people if we read the scriptures very carefully these people were known to the citizens of jerusalem because they appear to many so it's a great miracle it's a prelude of the resurrection to have a grandmother that just passed away or i mean uh, that uh, died 10 years ago or five years ago or three months ago she comes right out of the tomb and walks back home a yeah, very very chilling experience it's exactly what happened many people came out of the tomb possibly people that lived a holy life expecting the messiah they came out of the tombs and walked to the homes of their relatives they were, they were recognized by many even though most christians today believe in the resurrection of christ a lot do not actually know that our bodies will resurrect as well we often talk about saving our soul and uh, you know our souls our souls will go in the kingdom of God. The soul is in paradise. Souls do not go in the kingdom of God. The body and the soul together goes in the kingdom of God. The question is, how can we take part in his glorious resurrection? Because whether we like it or not, we're going to resurrect our body will resurrect the body the soul never dies the soul never dies not because it's immortal in itself not because it's a piece of god we explained this earlier it is not a piece of god or it's not from the substance of god the soul is created and the soul is really a great mystery. We have no answer on how the soul is transferred from the father to the children or from the mother to the children. There is 
you know, it is a mystery. There's certain theories, but it is a mystery. And the souls were not, uh, they were not, are not created now. We mentioned that God created everything once initially in those six days. Everything comes from the created things that God created. However, the body will resurrect. Every body will resurrect. The bodies that were burned, the bodies, you know, that, that were eaten by fish, whale, every body. However, not every body, not every body will enjoy the glorious resurrection of the Lord. Every human being will resurrect, but only those, only those that lived the hope of the resurrection, believed in Christ, and made Christ their ambassador, their ambassador, their mediator. Sins can only be forgiven through Christ. We must participate in his death. And the way we do that is when we're baptized. When we are baptized, we're actually <laughs> baptized in the death of Christ. The first three times that we are entering the Colin Vitra, the baptismal font, they symbolize the three days that Christ was in the earth. And the third time, when a day is coming up, that symbolizes the resurrection. So we must put to death this sinful nature, and we do that through our holy baptism. We are reborn through our holy baptism, and then once we live the life of Christ, then we can enjoy the glorious resurrection. So how can we become participants to this glorious resurrection? Number one, since we all sin constantly, we must repent. We need to repent daily. We fall daily, so we must repent and recognize our sins daily. We must repent constantly and through our entire lifetime. Repentance is not a one-time thing, going to confession once, and that's it. Confession and repentance are two different things. Many people confess, but few people repent. We also need to have fruits of repentance to be able to enjoy the glorious resurrection. After repentance, we need to have spiritual warfare. We need to fight. We need to have spiritual struggle. Agona. We must agonize spiritually. And we have to declare war against the three enemies of our souls and bodies. Against the devil, who does not want anybody to have a glorious resurrection. Why should he? Against the world, and against the passions. Against the passions. These are the three enemies that we must be in constant war against in order to take part in the glorious resurrection of Christ. We have to, more than ever, be very, very careful because the world pollutes. The world pollutes. The world is out there to pollute us. They teach our children from six, I just I get letters. It's amazing how, uh, in elementary school, they are teaching kids about everything about sex, everything about intercourse and masturbation and all these things. They think they're doing a service. 
They pollute the children. They open their eyes. It's exactly what they are doing. You take a five-year-old and tell him, Stephen, here's a pack of matches. Take a pack of matches. This is how it works, you see. Take this match, you strike it. Isn't that great? Okay, so now you know what fire is. And now you walk away. What do you think is going to happen? Most kids are pyromaniacs. You know that. <laughs> they like to light things up. They will burn the house down. That's exactly what they are doing to our children. They take these kids who may know some things and they open their eyes. Well, sure, I was talking to a person now in town yesterday. She was telling me that, you know, her son was molesting some children, supposedly. And she was going to some counseling. And what she saw there was unbelievable. Kids 17, 18 years old, they had molested over 100 children in five years within their families. Here in Allentown. Why? Because you take this box of match and you give it to the children and you tell them, this is how it is. Stupidity. So we have to be very, very, very careful against the world because people that have carnal sins will not take share in the glorious resurrection. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, we're not doing these lessons you know, just for knowledge. It's very, very serious. It's very serious. Yes, sins of the body eliminate the possibility of a glorious resurrection. And that's why we have confession and repentance. So we have to struggle to remain pure. If we fall, go to confession, we wash. We wash. And we don't go to confession once a year. Because a home doesn't get washed once a year. We can have the major cleaning times of the year, spring cleaning, fall cleaning, two, three times a year we take everything down and clean it. But also we have the weekly and monthly dusting, don't we? We don't dust things off. What happens after a month or two? It looks very, very bad. So we don't have to have, we don't have to have uh, deadly sins to go to confession. Well, there's many others, many others that we take to confession, and we struggle constantly. When we do that, we have the hope of enjoying the glorious resurrection. That Christ is promising to all of us. His brothers, he called us. And as John says once again, anyone that has this hope will see him as he appears. We we shall we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And Purity does not only pertain to you know sexual matters, but we can become we need to be pure from greed and also from jealousy. And these are all passions that destroy the soul. These are all passions that we need to war against because they are our enemies. Our greatest enemy is ourself, then the world, then the devil. If we conquer ourselves, then the rest will not be able to to tempt us. We'll have the strength to fight against these things. <clears throat> and now we come to the questions of some of the people in Philadelphia. We have a lot of them. And any questions you may have, if you want to write it down on a piece of paper, we can answer at some point in the following weeks or next year we can answer some of these questions the best way we can. We used several commentaries. 
a lot of this work has been done by Father Athanasius, but also we have other sources as well. And please remember that we do not exhaust each subject here. We simply try to give some insight to some of these things that you know, people ask. And one of the questions that people have from the area of Philadelphia is, what does our faith believe about the end of the world? And I'm using that question first only because we have been studying the book of the Revelation in the last six, seven weeks, and we kind of want to tie those two things together, and then next week we will study something else. Eschatology is only a teaching of the Christian faith. 